What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is all about the TUG B13, aka the Quadrajet Transfer Space Tug, or more commonly known as the Quad Jumper. That's mine! Its cost is unknown, but it was produced by Sub Pro Corporation, the same people that made the Z95 Headhunter and the ARC 170. So they know how to make great, solid built ships, and this helped to make the Quad Jumper a staple in orbital shipyards. In a way, it was a lot like the YT-1300, just at different points in the flow of galactic trade. The Millennium Falcon was just one of thousands of 1300s across the galaxy, as CEC made such a well-rounded ship that it was bought up by nearly every shipping company. The ability to quickly, cheaply, and reliably move cargo across the galaxy saw tons of these coming and going from major shipyards. But once the cargo was delivered, you would have smaller ships move around the containers to either their final destination on world, or regrouped in another part of the orbital shipyard to be sent out again. These pilots would often work in non-stop day and week-long shifts, having these extra seats located in the cockpit for relief pilots, and a pair of beds flanking the cramped crew quarters. You can see the rear hatch located here, and the fuel tank is located under the floor, and refueled via these hoses that connect to a crane that would then attach to an orbital tanker. That would of course power these four enormous engines, which were specialized to be able to work seamlessly both in atmosphere and in space. Each is split up into two sections, the turbine and ion drive. The turbines will engage in atmosphere, passing air through these compressor blades and out through the rear like a traditional jet. As the atmosphere thins out to the point where a jet engine would fail, the ion drive automatically engages. The fuel atomizer injects what is most likely to bonagas or a similar substance, hit with electricity and ionized in this chamber via a ring of power cells, resulting in the lower energy orange emissions instead of the blue seen in many other ships. Coolant pumps line this area to protect overheating, and a static discharge plate helps to get rid of electrical buildup that would affect the technology on board. Precipitation static, or the triboelectric effect, is built up when things separate after being rubbed together, and happens to ships passing through rain or dust in addition to just the air. As many shipping depots are on undesirable worlds, quad jumpers were often going through less than ideal climates, or passing through the dust-drenched asteroid belts. So although it may not look that impressive, it actually is one of the most important things on this ship. Although there were some small tractor beam emitters, the method of cargo moving was often as simple as connecting via this magnetic clamp. Massive cargo units could attach to both the ventral and dorsal sides, sandwiching the tug as it quickly shuttled around. This cockpit was designed to have a great view of the shipyards and cargo, with all these ceiling-to-floor transparasteel windows. When arriving on world, these three landing gears would extend, assisted in both flight and stabilization via these four repulsor vanes. Each would be able to independently push and pull off its surroundings in order to level out the ship. Here we can see the tow cable housing for objects that either couldn't be magnetically attached, or when you wanted to haul around a third unit. This hatch docking claw would connect at different spaceports, but you can see that getting down from this thing when on planet could be a bit tricky. You can also see that this thing has a pretty good height, at 5.6 meters or 18 feet tall, making it just a Wookiee shorter than the Millennium Falcon, and one-fourth the height of the AT-AT. At 7.98 meters or 26 feet long, it was less than a quarter that of the Falcon. And surprisingly, the A-Wing was more than an uncarplet longer than this ship. As for its top speed, stock it's rated at 1,150 km per hour or 714 miles per hour, placing it in between the X-Wing and a TIE Fighter. But many companies and private owners upgraded this ship and everything from fuel capacity, tractor beams, and even using that dorsal mount to slap on weapons and pirate detecting sensors. As the Quad Jumper and YT-1300 came to dominate their respective roles in the shipping chain, an intense rivalry bubbled up amongst these pilots. The pilots of the YTs saw themselves as brave, galaxy-spanning haulers who had to face the wilds of space while the tug crews mindlessly moved around boxes at a secure space station or just back and forth down to the same surface on a civilized world. Nothing glamorous or adventurous about that. But the tug pilots saw the YT folk as a bunch of simple-minded slackers whose job entailed punching in hyperspace coordinates and just sitting back and playing the Jarek for hours on end, passing through the mundane blue glow of hyperspace. They didn't have the discipline, intelligence, or raw piloting skills to manipulate hundreds of pieces of cargo in a hectic port for incredibly long shifts at a time. This of course led to not a few ego-fueled fights at the cantinas in these port cities, but I'll let you decide who had the harder job and who were the better pilots. 
But still, none of that explains why a random junker on Jakku would have one. While Unkar Plutt actually had quite a few quad jumpers, as he was saving up his ill-gotten gains to put into a small fleet of jumpers that could work as his personal shipping line. This would presumably cut out the middleman, whoever it was that was buying his valuables and taking them off-world, but he also hoped that they would jumpstart his criminal empire. With legitimate cargo being hauled around, Plutt hoped to hide weapon shipments inside of the junk. This would be a perfect way to smuggle arms around the watchful eye of both the First Order and the Republic. But of course, when Rey and Finn ran towards his best quad jumper, it stood no match for the TIE FO. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. Part of the design comes from the large engines of pod racers in episode 1, while wanting to retain that gritty cargo ship vibes of the original trilogy. And I think this is a really great example of a Star Wars ship. By that I mean that it is definitely something that doesn't make sense for a high-tech, spacefaring civilization. Why not just use drones, you might ask, as things like the quad jumper are already being replaced in our world. But remember, that is an important element to the Star Wars universe. Especially in the Outer Rim, life is cheap. Star Wars has always played in this cool niche where the tech has not liberated the people, not provided a clean and easy utopia. They toil just the same, now with just fancier tools. So in that way, I really like the look and the lore behind this ship. Of course, it first appeared in The Force Awakens, but additional information comes from Star Wars Encyclopedia of Starfighters and Other Vehicles, and The Force Awakens Incredible Cross-Sections. But that's it for the TUG B-13. If you want to connect with us, help support this channel, or get your own copies of the reference material used to make this video, be sure to check out the links in the description. Special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, but most important of all, remember, if you ever want to get out of a cantina without paying, just incite a brawl between the YT and TUG pilots. And the Force will be with you, always.